recording. This is session number 37 in uh, New Testament survey uh, with um, our church friends in uh, Italy and the Philippines. And today we'll be beginning in the book of Galatians. Uh, I haven't rehearsed this, so I don't know how long it will take. Uh, I've, I've got enough notes to go for uh, several months, but I'm going to try to do it all in one or two days. We'll, we'll see how we do with, uh, with this book of Galatians. Um, Galatians is probably the first of the, uh, the books of Paul's letters to be written. Uh, he, uh, uh, at the uh, uh, end of his uh, first journey, he came back to Antioch of Syria uh, and um, was involved getting ready for the uh, Jerusalem Council, the, the discussion of uh, how Jewish Christians needed to be in order to be saved, uh, and a very, very important decision. And along the way, sometime in there, he wrote to the church in uh, uh, Galatia. Now, Galatia is a, a generic term. It's a, a region of central Turkey. The name was given to this area by the Romans. Uh, it, uh, the political boundaries changed from time to time during antiquity none of which makes much difference for us. Uh, it's uh, interesting, but not essential to know that uh, Luke, uh, the author of Acts, was very precise, uh, noting the geographic boundaries that were present during his time. Uh, and those things change from time to time. Uh, a careful study of the place names and the boundaries demonstrate that Luke was writing in the middle of the first century, which, of course, is what the Bible claims. Uh, but it's also backed up by secular history. It's all, it's all pretty clear. But none of that really matters. Let's, uh, let's share the screen. I'm going to begin with, uh, with the Galatian epistle. Let me see if I can get this to go. There we go. Bingo, there it is. Okay, uh, Galatians is uh, much loved by the church, uh, perhaps by theologians more than others, but it's a, it's a fascinating little book. Uh, what, uh, what Paul is doing here uh, is uh, developing elements of the doctrine of justification by faith. Uh, you know, because of the emphasis on uh, a justification based on faith and not works, uh, Galatians becomes the centerpiece of the Reformation. Uh, one of the, uh, the premier arguments in the church throughout all of the centuries has been the relative weight of faith and works in salvation. Uh, and uh, the Roman Catholic Church has taken a position uh, that works are really important. Uh, Roman Catholics don't believe in a salvation by works. They believe in a salvation by faith. Uh, but the, uh, the works part of the equation is very large. When we do a theology or church history class, uh, that's one of the things we talk about, how how these various areas developed. The book of Galatians is central to that whole argument. And frankly, the argument continues today. Uh, there are church groups who teach that our salvation is primarily based on our own good decisions, our own uh, good works, uh, that uh, we are uh, initially justified by our works, and we are kept saved by our good works. Uh, what can you say? Uh, they're often very nice people uh, because their salvation depends on being very nice. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they've misunderstood the gospel. Uh, and uh, uh, what 
what Paul is doing here is laying a, a heavy emphasis uh, on the doctrine of justification by faith. Now, oh, one thing I have to, to say, and I, I'll develop this with a diagram uh, a little farther into this, uh, is that the phrase justification by faith can be a little misleading. Those of you who've been with me through Romans know that the, the salvation system is much more complex. Uh, it, the, the faith is not what causes justification. Faith is actually one of the elements in the response to regeneration. A justification is a response to faith. And I'll, I'll show you how that works. I'll, we'll, we'll draw another diagram today. I'm not going to do Dead Fred again. Uh, but if you've been through Dead Fred, uh, you know the regeneration, conversion, and justification happen in that order. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll take another look at that from a different direction today. This little book of Galatians almost certainly helped the early church to separate itself from Judaism. Uh, the, uh, the point of the book of Galatians uh, is that uh, we Christians may have Jewish roots, but we don't have to become Jewish in order to become Christian. Uh, and that was a very big deal. That's, that's what, uh, what uh, Paul is doing here. Okay, as we get into this next slide, a little bit about the authorship. Uh, Paul wrote the book of Galatians. Uh, strangely enough, this is one of the few books in the New Testament that even the far left-wing crazy critics uh, in Germany, the Tübingen critics, uh, can't argue against. <laughs> this book was written by the Apostle Paul. There's just no doubt. Uh, everybody believes that uh, the evidence is overwhelming, uh, and uh, they, those who believe there never was an Apostle Paul can dispute it, but they don't have a case. The readers are the churches of Galatia, and this would include uh, groups that Paul planted in Antioch, uh, of Pisidia, Lystra, Derby, and Iconium. And those are all in Central Asia Minor, uh, South Central Turkey today. The uh, letter was probably written from Antioch of Syria in 48, just before the Jerusalem Council. And I've included this picture just for the fun of it. This is an artist's conception of the location of ancient Antioch at the time of the Crusades. Uh, just to, it isn't all that important for the book of Galatians, but it's, I, I think it's important historically to remember that Antioch of Syria is one of the most important Christian cities of uh, the ancient world. Uh, and when it was taken uh, by the Muslims in 640 AD, uh, that ended half a millennium of uh, Christian teaching in that city. The Christian population continued in the city of Antioch uh, well into the time of the Crusades. So when the Crusaders came to Antioch in 1096 AD, they were attempting to liberate a Christian city from the Muslim invaders who had come 300 years earlier. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is not, uh, the Crusades was not uh, evil European Christians taking over peaceful Muslim lands. This, this, was, a, this was a rescue mission. This was a liberation. Uh, nevertheless, that's, that's just something else. The false teachers that we uh, see in Galatia were trying to introduce Jewish practices. They were undermining Paul's authority. Now, Paul is really important. Uh, we can think of Paul as a fifth gospel. 
So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Paul provides a system, a systematic evaluation of the gospel message. Uh, Paul's take on the doctrine of salvation is central to the biblical message. Uh, he is consistent with everything that Jesus taught uh, and with the other apostles. There's no, no question that they're all teaching the same thing. But Paul puts it all together in a clear, well-defined system. And we can think of that as the uh, the gospel according to Paul. Uh, and uh, his, his system lays the, the foundation for a, uh, a church that is separate from Judaism, a church that is built on faith rather than on works. Okay, uh, the false teachers uh, were introducing a kind of legalism. Uh, and uh, we argue about which particular kind of legalism but for our purposes right now, it's not going to matter. Okay, uh, the purpose and theme of the book of Galatians, first, to vindicate his own authority and his message. This is important because Paul was not one of the original 12 apostles. Uh, and so a, uh, an argument against Paul has always been, he was not one of the 12, therefore his message is uh, irrelevant. Uh, and uh, Paul writes Galatians in order to make the argument uh, that even though he wasn't one of the 12, he was directly chosen by Christ and experienced a direct revelation of the gospel from Christ himself. Uh, and this is um, a reiteration of what we've already seen in the book of Acts, uh, Luke writes Acts largely to validate the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Uh, and Paul here, writing to the Galatians, uh, realizes that his authority is, uh, is being undermined by false teachers in the Galatian churches. Uh, that he writes to vindicate his own authority and the truthfulness of his message. Paul argues very strongly here for justification by grace through faith. Uh, justification by grace through faith. Notice I'm adding the word grace. This is not just justification by faith. This is justification by grace through faith. I'm going to explain the relationship of uh, justification and grace and faith again in, in just a little bit. Paul argues strongly against a return to Jewish legalism. Uh, and I think one of the most important things that Paul does in Galatians is argue that Jewish legalism is an imposition. It is an incorrect understanding of the Old Testament message. Uh, Paul argues that to be Jewish is to understand inherently a salvation that is based entirely on the grace of God and received through faith. Paul is arguing that there's nothing more Jewish that you can do than to receive salvation by grace through faith. Uh, and he uses the illustration of Abraham to build that message. Now, we've already seen Paul do this in Romans chapter 4. Abraham is the faith guy. Uh, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness, continues to be the justification by faith passage in the Bible. And it's in the Old Testament, at the very beginning of the Old Testament, that has always been true and has always been the way of salvation. The fact that some Jews throughout history have taught that our salvation is dependent on works uh, does not argue against the biblical emphasis. Uh, so there we have it, and uh, we'll launch right in to uh, chapter, chapter one. The first five verses, salutation. He starts right off. Uh, he's an apostle by the uh, authority of God. Let me find that directly. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, 
but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches in Galatia. He's an apostle. He wasn't appointed by man, wasn't voted in by man. He was selected directly by Jesus Christ and by God the Father. He starts right out defending his authority and then says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace in that order. Uh, you want peace with God? Refer to the grace of God. Start with the grace of God. And on it goes from there. Paul launches right into a uh, denunciation of the Galatian heresy. I am astonished <laughs> that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So Paul is coming right out and saying it. Uh, the, uh, the gospel uh, is one thing. There can't, there can't be nine different gospels. Uh, uh, when you are listening to somebody teaching a gospel of works, it is a different gospel than Paul's gospel of grace. Uh, these people who are troubling you are uh, false teachers. Uh, Paul says, I'm astonished that you would so quickly desert. Uh, the next section of uh, the book, the next paragraph going down through the, uh, the middle of uh, uh, chapter two is Paul's defense of his own authority. Uh, and here he's, uh, he's going to tell the story of uh, his uh, conversion. The uh, Damascus Road conversion story is the, uh, the kind of story that uh, deserves to be told over and over again. We've heard it several times, road to Damascus and away he went. Okay, for I would not uh, would have you know, brothers, that the gospel was that it is preached by me is not man's gospel. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So that's important. Uh, uh, Paul is claiming here a direct connection to the. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, words of God himself, the specific direct revelation. Uh, the, the thesis uh, is that Paul got his message directly from Christ as a revealing, a, a removal of the cover, so to speak. His gospel is consistent with the broader apostolic message. When, when you look at Paul's gospel, he's not a, uh, disagreeing uh, with the preaching of Peter specifically, who is uh, uh, very clear in what he teaches uh, in the New Testament, nor with John, who is also very clear. Uh, he is uh, in fact, producing a uh, systematization. What I mean by that, when I say that Paul's uh, work is systematic, uh, what I'm claiming is that, that Paul is the first real theologian of the church. What theologians do is to take the gospel message, to take the stories of the Bible, uh, and distill that down into uh, outlines and definitions and uh, a sequence for teaching. Paul does that. Uh, he is uh, producing clear definitions of the gospel propositions. Uh, and uh, he's doing this in a way that is quite different from what the other apostles were doing. The other apostles were definitely preaching the gospel and they wouldn't disagree with Paul. Uh, but what Paul is doing is putting it all together, connecting all of the dots, making 
making it all clear. Uh, so really, if we want to understand the doctrine of salvation, uh, we have to begin with Paul. Uh, there, uh, uh, the others are, uh, are good, they're correct, they're right, uh, they fill in our blanks, uh, but Paul uh, gives us the structure for understanding our salvation. <coughs> In uh, the rest of this chapter, Paul uh, tells the story of his life before his conversion in 13 and 14, how he was a Pharisee, how he was uh, zealous against the church. The conversion event itself is in verses 15 and 16. Uh, here's a Damascus road knocked off the horse and all of the rest of it. Uh, after his conversion, the trip to Damascus, uh, his time there, and a, a period of time uh, when he was uh, uh, isolated and uh, then in training. Uh, some of this we don't get uh, elsewhere. Uh, Paul goes on into chapter two to speak of 14 years. Now, there's some argument and I think is a valid argument, whether there is a three-year period in addition to a 14-year period, or if the three years is a part of the 14, and I'm not going to go into that argument here. Uh, but at the end of 14 years, which would put us about between 45 and 47 AD, uh, Paul was recognized by the apostles. Uh, he went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. Here's what Paul is doing. Uh, just in these two verses, but uh, seriously, in this meeting that he had with the apostles, uh, Paul was emphasizing his uh, independence from the apostles because of his separate revelation. I went up because of revelation, and I said it before them. Uh, but also he emphasizes the basic unity of his gospel with the apostolic gospel. And he was willing to privately submit his take on the gospel to the rest of the apostles, just to make sure that he had not missed something, misunderstood something, that he had it right. Uh, and I really love that. Paul was willing to submit to authority, uh, but he uh, was also insistent on the authority of his message. Uh, he wasn't going to go off half cocked uh, teaching a different message than the apostles did. He really didn't want that to happen. Uh, he wanted to be consistent with them. Uh, but he knew that his definitions and his structure uh, were a new thing for him, for them, for the church. Uh, and he needed their approval and got it. Uh, as we carry on in chapter two, uh, an interesting little bit as uh, his uh, interaction with the apostle Peter. He seems to have uh, had a, uh, an interaction with, uh, with Peter. Look at verse 11, uh, which I don't have here, but you've got your Bibles. Uh, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men from uh, 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 for before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came back, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Okay, uh, that's hypocritical on Peter's part. Uh, by this time, he has already had the meeting with Cornelius. He already knows 
uh, that God has commanded the gospel to go to the Gentiles. Uh, so Peter uh, was being a hypocrite. He just didn't want to cause trouble uh, with the circumcision party, the, the group in uh, Antioch and in Jerusalem primarily, who were arguing that Christians needed to become uh, Jews first. Um, Peter was wrong on that, uh, but he goes on, verse 15, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Okay, there's a lot going on in, in this, uh, this little passage. Um, uh, Paul says, we're Jews by birth, but we know as Jews that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ. We know that we are justified by faith. <laughs> How, how, can, how can Paul say that? Uh, 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 today, uh, if you uh, uh, listen to uh, uh, Jewish teachers, and once in a while, it's kind of, it, it, I do enjoy talking to Jewish people, especially those with some, uh, some good background. They argue that Judaism is not one of those faith religions that you just have to believe some stuff and you don't have to do anything. Uh, well, Christianity isn't one of those faith religions. It's actually the only faith religion, and it's a biblical faith, not a New Testament faith. Uh, the, the Jews have uh, missed the important point of the Old Testament uh, emphasis of salvation by faith, not by works. So, um, what do I'm going to do here? Chapters three and four, Paul is going to launch into this, uh, and uh, there are some definitions that are going to be really important. Uh, here on the, uh, the slide, uh, justification and faith, a couple of things we need to need to work through. Uh, justification is a uh, uh, is, is a ju judicial thing. It's a forensic phrase. Justification is a judicial verdict, like a judge banging his ga gavel and pronouncing a verdict. The verdict of innocence on the forgiven sinner is justification. Justification cannot be pronounced until the sinner is forgiven. So justification isn't the forgiveness of sin, that has to be taken care of before the not guilty verdict can be brought. Uh, and so we have to ask, well, how does that happen? Well, justification is by faith. Now we know that faith uh, primarily is the attitude of trust. That attitude of trust is built on God's word. And a careful study of God's word is what builds hope. And we talked about that back in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that trust, that trusting attitude built on God's word produces active obedience to God. And so good works happen. Uh, and those are uh, characterized by love, our love for God, our love for other believers, and our love for the world, ought to result in uh, good works all over the place. Uh, so it is not a biblical notion that we are saved in spite of our bad works, but rather that we are saved for good works. I'm not saved because I'm good. I was saved from my badness in order that I might be good. Uh, the salvation is not based on my works. It's based simply on the grace of God. Now, at this point, I need to 
I need to build a, a bigger picture. And so I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to end this share and uh, uh, take up with my, uh, my iPad. Let's see if we can make this work. Okay, cancel that, share content, whiteboard. All right, here we go. Uh, and uh, what I want to talk about here is, uh, see if I can get this right, Paul's gospel. And I'm going to call this Paul's gospel of grace. Because the, the emphasis of Paul in his gospel message is not so much uh, a, a gospel of faith as it is a gospel of grace. Grace is God's activity. Faith is human response to the grace of God. Uh, the gospel that Paul is, uh, is preaching can be divided up into three parts. In eternity past, in the present, and in eternity future. Let's see, I'm going to make that go away for now. Okay, so eternity past, present, and the future. In eternity past, we, uh, we see ideas like the purpose of God, the decree of God, uh, election happens in eternity past, predestination and foreknowledge happen in eternity past. On the basis of what God has done in the past, there is a movement into the present. The call of God results in regeneration, which results in conversion. Conversion is the visible outward response of the believer to the call of God. And that conversion results in faith and repentance. In response to the faith, God justifies. So justification happens here. Okay, where's the faith? Faith is part of conversion. Okay. As a result of justification, there is the beginning of the process of sanctification which is the process of becoming like Christ. And you'll notice that that sanctification takes us into the future. Uh, the eternal state is the point at which we begin to accurately reflect the glory of God forever in heaven. This is our relationship with God in heaven for all of eternity. Uh, and the preparation for that happens in the past. Uh, Paul's system of salvation is an all-encompassing uh, system. And you'll notice the key idea is the grace of God. God, by his grace in eternity past, purposed to save, to foreknow, to elect, to predestine. In grace, God sent the Holy Spirit to do the work of the call, of conversion, of justification, and of sanctification. He looks forward to the fulfillment of that grace in heaven. All that is done here is built on the free gift, which is God's grace. Okay, I'm going to make this disappear. And we'll go back to oh, do, 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 sharing the screen. There are too many things going on. It's, it starts getting kind of interesting. Okay, so uh, Paul's uh, message, Paul's gospel message is a bit more complex than... Um, 
it's a little more complex than I would like it to be, uh, but it's exactly what uh, it's exactly what Paul is teaching. Uh, and he's being very careful to put it all together so that we understand it. The phrase justification by faith can be thought of as a shorthand for Paul's system. And he clearly was teaching this uh, to the Galatians. So we speak of uh, purpose of God and election, foreknowledge, uh, predestination in eternity past. Uh, the call or regeneration by the Holy Spirit, also called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, conversion itself, which involves faith and repentance, the judicial pronouncement of not guilty, which is justification, practical growth from there for the rest of life, which is sanctification, and finally, the completion of it all, glorification in heaven. All of this uh, is tied together in the single phrase, justification by faith. We should understand, though, that justification by faith is not a complete statement of the entire system. I don't begin the salvation process by exercising faith. And that's important. My faith is actually a gift of God. We're going to see that in the next little book that we get to, the book of Ephesians. So let's see here. We'll start out at the beginning of chapter three and look at some of what, uh, what Paul has to say. He's uh, uh, vindicating the doctrine of justification by faith, starting out uh, by beating up on the Galatians a little bit, the first, uh, first two, two verses here. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Uh, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Okay, that's a, that's a basic question. Did you do the works of the law in order that the Spirit would come to you? Or did you hear with faith and then experience the, uh, the Spirit? Uh, which, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? And uh, uh, for, uh, for Paul, clearly, uh, the uh, the uh, act of faith is foundational. Verse three: Are you so foolish, having begun by the spirit, are you now perfected by the flesh? Uh, and this is uh, this is an argument for the the kind of legalism that the Galatians were apparently accepting. Uh, uh, we, we make a distinction between justificational legalism and sanctificational legalism. In other words, we, justificational legalism, or legalism would be the, the doctrine that we are initially saved. We come to Christ by good works, or God rewards us for our good works by saving us. Sanctificational legalism is a variation on that theme. It says, we may have come to Christ by grace through faith, but we can only continue in Christ by following a set of rules. And it is entirely likely that uh, the Galatians were teaching or being taught that they needed to follow a set of rules. Now that they'd come to Christ, they needed to follow a set of rules in order to grow. Uh, uh, Paul, is, Paul is treating this as though the two positions are actually the same position. Whether we believe that we are initially saved by works or that we grow in Christ by good works. Uh, we're teaching essentially the same error. Uh, and the, the correct position uh, is the uh, all grace position. 
I'm saved by grace. I'm kept saved by grace. I continue to grow by the grace of God. Uh, it is all the work of God in my life. Uh, and uh, that's, that's an important distinction. Okay. Does he who supplies the spirit to you uh, and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith. <laughs> so, by your good works, do you uh, uh, do you, do you see the miracles? Uh, does the does the spirit of God transform lives by good works? <laughs> no, no. The good works are are one of the symptoms of the presence of the spirit in our lives. Okay, Paul goes on. The example of Abraham is in uh, verses uh, six through nine. Um, yeah, because it's uh, it's so important. Verses uh, verse five. Uh, uh, does he who supplies the Spirit and works miracles among you do so by works of the law, by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted him as righteousness? Uh, Abraham's experience is the key. Uh, Paul knew that salvation was by faith alone. The phrase that we find in Genesis 15. Uh, Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. It includes three words, uh, believe or faith, counted or accounted or reckoned, and righteousness. Righteousness is the, the condition of having met the absolute standard of God. Counted is the forensic or um, uh, legal term of writing down, writing in the account book, uh, that which is already demonstrated to be true. Uh, I know this thing is true, and uh, 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 now I account it to be true. God counts him righteous, uh, righteous on the basis of Abraham's faith in God. And Abraham trusted in God as a result of God's call. So God called out to Abraham, and Abraham believed God. That belief was the first symptom of the grace of God in Abraham's life. And that faith is what is counted as righteousness. Uh, not that Abraham was such a good guy prior to this. Matter of fact, he was probably a bad guy. Uh, and uh, that's the point that Paul is trying to make all through this book. Uh, know then, verse 17, that uh, it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. If you think you can be a son of Abraham by good works, if you can be a Jewish because of your good works, uh, you've got a problem. Uh, the, the good works are one of the fruits of uh, justification, uh, not, the, not the cause of justification. Okay, Paul goes on to talk about the value of the law. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. <laughs> in other words, when you compare your life to the uh, requirements of the law, you discover that you fall short. That's the point of the law, uh, to draw the, uh, uh, the human individual to faith in Christ. It is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by his faith. There's that phrase from Habakkuk 2. This is the second time that we see Paul quoting this. We're going to find a third quotation of this passage over in the book of Hebrews in a little, little different uh, context. Uh, but again, uh, Paul is saying the the righteous man, and how does he become righteous? Well, he becomes righteous by faith. Uh, 
Okay, so the faith produces righteousness. Righteousness ought to produce continuing faithfulness. Righteousness comes first. Good works, which is faithfulness, comes afterwards. Uh, the key to uh, uh, to the development of righteousness in life is Christ himself. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. There's a whole lot going on in, uh, in that verse. The crucifixion uh, paid the price. When Jesus went to the cross to die for us, he paid the price for our sin. That made it possible uh, for the blessing of Abraham to come to everyone who is in Christ. Uh, if you are in Christ, you have, uh, you have uh, vicariously experienced the curse of the law so that the sentence having been carried out we might receive the promised spirit also by faith. It's really a pretty cool idea. Uh, and uh, uh, Paul lays it out uh, very clearly here. We're redeemed from the curse by Christ's work so that we might receive the spirit through faith. That's cool. Cool. Okay. The... Uh, <sighs> Faith is a, uh, a, a, a permanent concept. The concept of salvation by faith, not works, is the consistent biblical teaching. This is what I mean, Paul says. The law, which came 430 years afterwards, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. Okay, what's he talking about? The law comes under Moses. It's given in roughly 1450 BC, which is 430 years after the covenant was given to the patriarchs, specifically to uh, Abraham. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, received the uh, the Abrahamic and patriarchal covenant, uh, which is a promise given by God to Abraham uh, to uh, provide not only a land and a blessing, but uh, the Messiah himself uh, and a blessing to the whole world, Jews and Gentiles together, on the basis of Abraham's faith. Uh, God said, go, so Abram went, and God accounted his faith as righteousness. That happened 430 years before the law was given. So this salvation by faith concept is the, uh, is, is the permanent thing. Uh, the imposition of law was meant for the Jewish people and as a kind of a, a framework for righteous living. But it's never been uh, an argument for salvation by works. For if salvation is by works of the law, then how was Abraham saved? How was Isaac saved? Uh, and yet they were believers. Uh, warts and all, even when they failed, they were believers. Uh, in the same way, apart from the works of the law, uh, modern Christians are saved by God's grace, received by faith. Uh, there is no other way. Our good works are a response of loving faithfulness to the grace of God. 
So God has saved us. We've been converted. We've exercised faith and repentance. Now we've turned our lives around and we're beginning to go in the right direction. Those good works are important. Uh, with our good works of love, we can change the world and we're encouraged to do that. But that is not the cause of our salvation. It is the chief symptom of salvation. Okay, verse 19, 20, the purpose of the law was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Okay, so the law is important. Uh, there were transgressions. And so until Christ would come, uh, the, the law was in place uh, as verse 24, a guardian or some would say a schoolmaster until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. And that leads us to the believer's present position. Uh, Paul says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, you're all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Paul's point is that uh, everyone who has come into Christ <coughs> by grace through faith, whether Jew or Greek, male, free, uh, female, slave or free, is one in Christ. We are all part of one body. We are all part of one family. Uh, and it is not necessary uh, for Gentiles to become Jews before they can become Christians. That's uh, Paul's central point. That was the point back in the book of Acts. Chapter four, Paul uses a, uh, a legal illustration. And uh, I'll read just, uh, just a little bit of this. Uh, an heir, verse one, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though the owner has everything. Uh, he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Uh, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son on, uh, into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Uh, so you are no longer a slave, but a son, if a son, then an heir through God. Okay, so this is a legal inheritance thing. It's a, uh, uh, the illustration uh, has to do with the uh, uh, ancient Roman and uh, Greek traditions of uh, the passing on of an inheritance. Uh, the, uh, uh, the father uh, might well uh, <clears throat> know that his son is going to inherit everything. And as the, as the little boy grows up, he knows that he's kind of special because he's the heir and he's going to inherit all his dad's property. When he turns 13 or 14, maybe 15, depending on when the father decides he's going to do it, they have a public announcement in, in the forum or in the gate of the city where all of the other business people can stand around and hear. And I say, this is my beloved son. I am well pleased with him. Hear him. That's the, the son making ceremony. And until that happens, the son doesn't possess everything. So what's Paul doing here. He's, uh, he's saying um, <clears throat> that under the law, uh, we had, uh, uh, we had schoolmasters, we had teachers, the, the law was a kind of a guardian for us. Uh, but in Christ, we are free, we have come, we have come into our adulthood as joint heirs with Jesus. Neat concept. Uh, the personal plea, Paul goes on, uh, formerly when you didn't know God, you were enslaved to those that are by nature not gods. But now that you have come to know God or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again 
to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to become once more. Kind of an awful thing. Uh, the uh, pagan religions and non-Christian religions in general, and I'm going to include Talmudic Judaism in this, uh, are uh, religions that demand good works. Uh, Islam, for example, uh, says there are seven things that you've got to do, or maybe it's five things. These things you have to do, or you're going to be judged for all of eternity. You've got to go on pilgrimage. You've got to give alms to the poor. You've got to you know, pray toward Mecca six times a day. All these things you've got to do, or hellfire waits for you. Um, that's that's a curse. Uh, the, these are the elementary principles of the world, the naive uh, misunderstanding of how salvation works. Uh, and uh, you want to become a slave to that again, you foolish Galatians, you. The uh, biblical illustration of the difference between a law salvation and a faith salvation is given with the uh, distinction between Hagar and Sarah. Now, Sarah was Abraham's wife. She was the uh, legitimate wife of uh, Abraham. Uh, Hagar was the slave girl who uh, gave birth to Ishmael after Sarah suggested that that would be a good idea. Uh, it turned out that was not a very good idea, and Ishmael is nothing but trouble for uh, Abraham and for the Jewish people ever since. Uh, and uh, uh, Paul uses Hagar and Sarah uh, in an illustration, uh, a kind of allegory. Uh, it isn't really an allegory, but it's uh, often called an allegory. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now, is she really Mount Sinai in Arabia? Well, no, of course not. Uh, Hagar is uh, the slave girl who gave birth to Ishmael. Uh, but Hagar can be represented as Mount Sinai in Arabia, which is the, uh, the uh, place where the law was given. So Hagar represents the law. Uh, she corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Okay, there's the, the, the key point. The slavery uh, to the law is how Paul characterizes Judaism and all of the non-Christian religions that argue that good works are the key to heaven. And then he makes a contrast. But the Jerusalem above is free as she is our mother. The Jerusalem above has got to be a reference to heaven. Uh, and uh, we, we see at the end of the New Testament, the, uh, uh, the reference to a new Jerusalem. Uh, when, uh, when we are uh, 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 done on, uh, on this earth, uh, we get a, a new heaven and a new earth. In the midst of the new heaven is a new Jerusalem. Uh, the Jerusalem above, and this is free. Uh, this is our mother, not Hagar, but Sarah. We're not children of the slave, but of the free. Uh, and the key to uh, Christianity is freedom. Chapters five and six defend the idea of Christian liberty. Uh, verse one of chapter five is the, is the key to this whole thing. Uh, for it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again <coughs> to a yoke of slavery. Uh, there's uh, five points that Paul makes in this section, and I'll just summarize them briefly. Well, actually, in this, in this whole section, we'll look at some individual bits. But turning to the law ruins grace. <laughs> If, if we turn again to the law, what have we done? We've, uh, we've uh, turned our backs on the grace of God. Uh, secondly, turning to the law makes a man a debtor. We accept an obligation uh, when, in fact, 
we have no need to. There are no obligations. There is freedom. Uh, thirdly, fall, uh, turning to the law is to fall away from grace. Interesting word, to fall away from grace or walk away from the grace of God. Uh, Paul is not saying here that a person who begins to be legalistic loses his salvation, but rather that he is walking away from the concept of uh, freedom in the grace of God. Uh, and uh, Paul goes on to say that, I, you know, such a one is severed from Christ, uh, chopped off as with an ax, uh, strong language. It says, instead, you turn to the law and hinder the progress of other believers. Who has messed you up, Paul says, because you were running so well. Paul feels like he's gotten a good start for them, and now they've, they've messed up their Christian lives. They've, uh, uh, they've tripped and fallen. Uh, okay. Uh, in uh, verses 13 through 15, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. In other words, Paul is calling for a love-limited liberty. Our liberty in Christ, our freedom in Christ, is uh, very prominent in Paul. But Paul always calls uh, for uh, a limiting of our liberty. Of course, I'm free. Uh, and I'm not going to be sent to hell for my sin. But that doesn't mean I ought to sin. Uh, of course, I'm free, but that doesn't mean I have the freedom to offend my uh, my brothers. Uh, Paul keeps coming back to this notion of love-limited liberty. Uh, we should not mistake our liberty for a license to hurt other people. Our good works and our good attitudes matter a great deal. Uh, but and I would emphasize this only when we act freely. If I am commanded to do a thing and I do it out of obedience, uh, that's one thing. Uh, if it is suggested that a good thing should be done and I do it freely, I'm to be commended. Paul says, I would have you be free and to freely choose to do the good thing. I think that's an important distinction. Uh, and uh, I believe that this is true in the church and in the broader society, uh, that uh, when we choose to do the right thing simply because it's the right thing to do and we choose to do it, that's a much better position than to do the right thing because we're threatened with jail if we don't. Uh, you know, if I choose not to rob the bank because there's a big man with a pistol standing there, uh, there's, there's no commendation for me. If I choose not to rob the bank, because that would simply be wrong, and I would never do a thing that wrong, that's commendable. Uh, don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Okay, from here, Paul goes on uh, to uh, explain what a life according to the Spirit really ought to look like. He describes the, uh, the acts of the flesh, now he gives us a list of the fruit of the spirit, which is very important. This is a this passage actually is uh, uh, preachable as a series. Uh, we could do each and every one of these and look at the, the biblical themes of love and joy and peace and so on. Uh, but it's love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. When we are walking in the spirit and being obedient 
to Christ, our lives are characterized by Christ-like character. That's the point. I don't live like Christ in order that I might be saved. Rather, I live like Christ because I have been saved. That's where I ought to be heading. Okay. Oh, da, da, dum, dum. Chapter six uh, talks about our, our attitude toward one another. Uh, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the love of Christ. Uh, our attitude toward one another ought to be emphasizing a willingness to serve. Uh, if, uh, if a friend has fallen, lift him up, try to restore him. Uh, if he's having trouble, carry his burden with him. You don't necessarily take it all over, but carry his burden with him. Uh, have a good attitude towards pastors and teachers. Uh, hey, folks, uh, it's, it's the right thing to take care of a pastor. Uh, I have an attitude in, uh, in my own life of always believing the best of uh, the pastors that God has put over me. Uh, I support them. I pray for them. I, uh, I help them when I can. I, I, I try to be useful uh, to my pastor. Uh, and uh, I think that's just the right thing to do. Now, if I find I can't support my pastor, I disappear quietly. I would never split the church. Uh, and I, I am, uh, I'm in a position in my life where I could easily split a church, uh, but I would never do that. Uh, if, if I have to leave, I will leave quietly, and I will not encourage anyone to go with me uh, because that's the right thing to do. Uh, just get out of the way and let uh, let the others do as they will. Uh, as much as you have an opportunity, Paul says in 610, do good to all men. You know, as far as it depends on you, be the good guy. Uh, and then if there's anything to boast about, let our boast be in Christ. Uh, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me. <laughs> In other words, the world is dead to me and I to the world. Uh, and all that matters anymore uh, is my service to Christ himself. Anyway, that's the little book of Galatians. I know there's more that can be done in Galatians. Uh, there's a, 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 it is a certainly possible to spend weeks and weeks studying the book of Galatians. Uh, there are a lot of individual questions that are asked and answered in the commentaries. Uh, you all go for it. There, there's lots there. But this lays out what I think are the, the key elements of uh, what we need to understand in this little book of Galatians. On Wednesday, we're going to begin the book of Ephesians. And again, I'm going to try to not to get all bogged down, but I, I think Ephesians will take me longer than Galatians. Uh, but uh, still, we're going to try not to bog down in all of the details, particularly chapter one. If you look at chapter one of Ephesians, there's all kinds of words to define, but we've defined them already. Let's look at how they work in a system. Uh, the same thing is going on in Galatians. All right. Love you guys. Uh, we'll see you again on, uh, on Wednesday. Uh, and, uh, uh, we look forward to uh, getting together with you once again. God bless everybody. Thank uh, you. My pleasure. Thank Love you, you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. John. Ciao. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye.